Thank you for coming today to our colloquium series. Um, on behalf of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here at NYU and its director, Jim Ling, we welcome to the fourth lecture of the Spring Colloquium. Um, Nancy Postero is going to talk about performing indigeneity in Bolivia, masks and protest in the struggle over the TPs. Um, I want to acknowledge our co-organizers, uh, Catherine Smith, Edgardo Perez Morales, and the three of us, myself, Pamela Calle, have organized this series, and we're really proud and <laughs> glad that you're here, Nancy. Um, Nancy is, is a long friend of mine. I've known her since the 80s. And is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of California, San Diego. She's the author of Now We Are Citizens, Indigenous Politics in Post-Multicultural uh, Bolivia. She has edited several collections and special journal issues, including the struggle for indigene indigenous rights in Latin America, living in actually existing democracies, uh, neoliberalism interrupted social change and contested governance in contemporary Latin America, the politics of indigeneity in Bolivia, past and present, and performance politics, spectacular productions of culture in contemporary Latin America. Um, She's completing now a new book was focusing on race, politics, and performance in plural national Bolivia. Um, your discussant will be our dear uh, colleague, Thomas Abercrombie, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology here at NYU. And we will come. Thank you. Thank you all so much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. My husband and I have had a beautiful weekend here and really enjoyed being in New York City. Thanks to Pamela, my friend and colleague for so many years, to Omar. Is Omar here? He or organized all the, the details, so thanks. I'm going to give a paper today that is a co-written piece with Nikki Fabricant from Towson University and with some collaborations from uh, graduate student Devin Bolio. So I want to acknowledge them. Many, mm, I kept going back and forth on my pronouns between I and we, and so whenever I say I, I really mean we. This is a we paper. So um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to keep dashing over here. So. Um, in 2011, several hundred lowland indigenous people began the march for life, for indigenous rights, and for the environment walking from the lowlands up the Andes to La Paz to protest a proposed highway through their territory known as the Titnis. Often wearing only, only sandals, the marchers covered nearly 1,200 kilometers on their journey from the tropical forests of the Beni region to the cold, dry highlands of La Paz. As they entered Cochabamba, halfway through the journey, they played, filled the plaza with music and lowland accents. Protesters planted uh, the Bolivian flag in the middle of the plaza along with a banner bearing the Batuhu flower that you see there, um, a symbol now associated with the lowland indigenous culture. They shouted, we are defending ourselves from destructive capitalism, long live the march. Urban residents, students, intellectuals, and NGO representatives joined the rally. Surrounding the plaza, they shouted in unison, we are all Titnis, todos somos Titnis. Such performances by indigenous people are not unusual in Latin America, where state development projects often disadvantage local peoples. What was surprising was that this march protested the government of Evo Morales, the indigenous president of Bolivia. The march was in response to Morales' plan to build a highway linking the tropics of Cochabamba to the Brazilian border. The highway was to be funded by the Brazilian National Development Bank, opening new possibilities for trade with Brazil. The Morales government claimed the highway would bring prosperity and trade to lowland peoples and to help the state achieve control of the national territory. But the proposed highway would run through the Isiboro Secure Indigenous Territory and National Park, known by its Spanish acronym, IPIS, both a forest preserve and a communally held indigenous territory. Some local indigenous communities were pleased with the possibility of the paved road and what it might bring linking them to bigger cities and markets and bringing increased access to education and healthcare systems. Others, however, sorry, oh, there's, sorry, I was wondering if I didn't have a map. There's the, the, the sign, the, the, the trajectory of the, of the, uh, of the road. 
Others, on the other hand, feared that the road would bring ever greater ecological destruction to a region already deeply affected by cattle ranching, illegal forestry, and coca growing. Um, many were particularly concerned that it would open up their lands to further colonization by the Andean coca growers who already inhabit one section of the park, the so-called Poligono Siete, which you can see at the very bottom there. The, the plan created an enormous controversy. One reason was that although the 2009 Constitution requires the state to carry out a prior consultation with any indigenous communities that might be af af affected by its development projects, the Bolivian government did not do so in this case. Instead, President Morales notoriously declared, like it or not, we will construct this highway. As a result, opponents claimed that the highway was a form of renewed internal colonialism. To register their opposition, especially to the lack of consultation, the Confederation of Bolivian Indigenous Peoples, CIDO, and the National Council of Ayus and Marcas of Cuyasuyo, CONAMAC, mounted two nonviolent marches. The first, in 2011, captured international attention when the national police intervened in the small town of Chaparina, tear gassing and firing rubber bullets at the protesters, including women and children. This changed the public debate substantially, and when the march finally did arrive in La Paz, it received a massive and warm welcome. Morales was forced to declare the park intangible, or untouchable, and to carry out an ex post facto prior consultation. Some communities were satisfied with the results of the march and the government's concessions, but others were not, and in 2012, Seville mounted a second march to protest the consultation process. The, 2011, excuse me, the 2012 march received much less public attention than the previous year, in part because the lowland organizations were really split on whether marching again was a good idea. When they did arrive in La Paz, they were unable to obtain any concessions for the government, and so they returned home empty-handed. However, the road still has not been built. After the government's consultation produced a pretty predictable result, substantial approval of the highway, Morales suspended the plan pending what he called elimination of extreme poverty in the region. In 2014, however, MAS officials made it clear that the highway project is indeed still in the works. In this talk, to contribute to what your series is looking at in terms of political imaginations, I want to focus on the political performances and the tropes and the ideas and the symbolism <coughs> that we saw emerging around the Tipeee's controversy. And this is one of millions of online posters and, and images that I'm going to, I'll show you a number of them, but a lot of them resulted. This is the third in a series of works that Nikki Fabricant and I have written about the Tipeee's case. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the other pieces so you'll understand that while this one is really discursive and performative, that's not all I do. Um, that is what I'm going to be focusing on this. In the first uh, paper, we focused on the ways that the lowland civic elites allied with the Tipnis protesters to oppose the Morales administration. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in this paper. <coughs> In the second, we place the struggles of, about Tipnis in the context of the long-term political economy of the lowlands region, especially the racialized labor regimes associated with agricultural commodity production and resource extraction. So in this piece, we turn our attention to the narratives told and contested um, through political performances during the controversy. Following Povinelli, I'll argue that the performances acted to condense long-term economic, political, and cultural tensions into an event. I'll show how a complex situation was distilled through performances and symbolic representations into a dualistic debate with deeply ethical repercussions. So my goal here is to show how performances themselves constituted this event through reiterated and disputed representations or figurations of indigeneity. And my hope is, is that this will help us complicate our understandings of both indigeneity and <coughs> resistance, and also to see how important performances are on the uh, to the political realm and to the political imagination. So let me step back for a minute to put the Tipnis case into a little bit of historical context. It's nice to be speaking to a group of Latin Americanists, so I don't have to give you too many details. I know you will already know much of this, but just on the off chance you don't know, I think I'll tell you a little bit about the, 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 the Morales and the Mons. Evo Morales and his movement against, uh, excuse me, movement towards socialism party came to power in 2005. 
challenging the neoliberal policies of previous regimes and promising to redistribute the patrimony of the country to its poor and indigenous populations. This anti-neoliberal agenda was paired with a promise to decolonize the Bolivian state to overcome the structures and practices of racism against its majority indigenous population and to implement a new vision of sustainable development based on indigenous cosmovision called vivir bien, or living well. The 2006 Constituent Assembly and the Constitution that it produced in 2000 and 2009 marked a radical change for Bolivia, which had previously been governed by white mestizo political class. The new Constitution declared Bolivia to be a plurinational state and declared the fundamental goal of the new state was to decolonize Bolivia. Thus, Morales and the MAS were charged with bringing into being a new revolutionary state and institutionalizing a proceso de cambio, or a process of change. Bolivian sociologists Torres and Arce argue that this, and in this interregnum period, a key task of the new government was to recon reconstitute and reconstruct a symbolic order as well as a political order. The MAS represented itself as both a continuity of the past, that is, past forms of national sovereignty, and here you can see um, the heroes of the wars of independence in the 1950s to revolution in the center banner, as well as something else and something radically different. And you can see that represented by the anti-colonial heroes on the left and indigenous uh, uh, activists on the right. So it was in this context of state consolidation that the Tikmis controversy exploded. The Mas government had done a remarkable job of constructing a hegemonic national narrative, and its development model had fueled an economic boom. Yet the Highway Project really drew attention to the deep contradictions the MAS, MAS narrative masked, and masks, I would say, including fundamental questions <coughs> about the state's ongoing natural resource extractivist development model. In their history of the development of the English state, historians Corrigan and Sayer suggest that the repertoires and, of practices and institutions that we conventionally, conventionally identify as the state are probably better thought of as cultural forms intended to construct a unified nation out of the diverse and often conflicting segments of society. And here, of course, they rely on Philip Abrams' provocative argument that the idea of the state acts to conceal the real history and relations of subjection behind an ahistorical mask of legitimizing, legitimating illusion. Rather than something hidden behind the mask of political practice, Abrams argued, the state is the mask obscuring practices of domination. In this paper, Nikki and I use the idea of masking to consider what's at stake in contemporary Bolivia. Needless to say, we were not the first to use the metaphor of mask to understand the Tigmis case. Given the deep contradictions between the government's discourses and its deeds, Indiv indigenous activists, scholars, and NGO workers commonly express their concerns regarding the Mas state in these terms. And in 2012, a high-profile group of intellectual dis dissidents issued a manifesto entitled the Mascarada of the Poder, the Masquerade of Power, with a mask of Morales on the cover. So we didn't come up with this idea, but we do try to build on and complicate these notions of masking in two ways. First, we examine how political performances by the Bolivian state, and particularly by Bolivian President Morales, acted to legitimate the social and political order, masking the form of domination involved. Krupa and Nugent, in their really great new volume on the Andean state, following Abrams' lead, ask, by what sets of practices, material, discursive, ritual, and performative, do people come to accept or not states as real or enduring parts of the social landscape? They argue that fantasy, fear, violence, and delusion play a central role in the production of that rule, but that this, this is concealed by state claims to neutrality and rationality. So we, we first start thinking uh, about, about that, about political performances by the state. And second, we consider how political performances and masks can be creative tools for social movements opposing and negotiating with the state. But I want to be clear that this is not just an oppositional notion of subaltern resistance to coercive state power. Instead, as I hope you'll see in the paper, we analyze how the actors claiming to unmask the state may in fact be engaged in a complicated dance with the state instead. In the process, they create their own masks 
often taking up one-dimensional tropes of indigeneity that mask other inequities. Thus, we're not trying to unearth the truth behind these many masks that we describe, but rather to show what's produced by this complicated and, uh, uh, and, and a set of interlinked performances. Finally, to understand the powerful symbols at play in this case, we draw on Donna Haraway's notion of figurations. We do that a little bit more in the longer paper. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but I think her idea of figurations are so helpful. She, she, she suggests that figures are and figurations are potent, embodied, incarnated, if you will, fictions that collect up the people in a story that tends to fulfillment, to an ending that redeems and restores meaning in a salvation history. I think you'll see as we go forward why that why that why that works for this paper. Haraway explored the figures at play in contemporary science discourses, showing how these narratives constructed categories that then became accepted as truth. But she also uses figurations as a radical feminist strategy to imagine new realities like the cyborg that escape the dualisms of nature, culture, male, female, and rationality imagination, resettling, resetting the stage for possible pasts and, and futures. So uh, we are indebted in this paper to Haraway. So Evo Morales's government has used indigenous histories, bodies, and storytelling and performances since its inception. This is a well-known <laughs> picture. He began his administration with a memorable inauguration ritual at the archaeological, uh, archaeological complex at Tiwanaku, where he was blessed and cleansed by Aymara spiritual leaders. There, invoking the Aymara notion of Pachacuti, or the reversal of the world order, he declared the beginning of a new millennium, millennium for indigenous peoples of the continent. For every critical legislative reform, Morales rallies support through spectacular events mobilizing indigenous history and tales of oppression and injustice. For instance, when Morales passed the new agrarian reform law in 2006, he organized social movement activists in the city of Peñas, the site of the brutal death of 18th century anti-colonial Aymara revolutionary Pacatari. Addressing thousands of peasant farmers, he declared, I stand before you today at the site where Julian Tupac Catari, one of the few literate Indian slaves, was descuartizado, or quartered. We are here to liberate our country, and, and Catari is the principal reference point for the indigenous struggles in Bolivia, and a constant reminder of the obligation to decolonize Bolivia. Through these symbolic and performative events, Morales created a new figuration in, in which he embodied the spirit of Catari as the leader of a movement liberating the country from a colonialist and racist history. And it's a very powerful effect in Bolivia. Here we see the hegemonic redemption story that I was talking about from, from <coughs> Haraway, where the new state promises to put the evil of colonialism in the past and lead the way to a future of justice. Morales also incorporates the story of, of social movement struggles in his own person, becoming a figure that represents all Bolivians, and especially all indigenous people. After Morales' 2014 new election, enormous billboards announced Todos Somos Evo, or, or Yo Soy Evo, or Nosotros Somos Evo. We are, I am, we all are Evo. A second important narrative that Morales embodies has to do with what Colin Farthing called resource nationalism. In contrast to the long history of national, natural resource extraction, first by the Spanish conquistadores, then by the white mestizo elite, and finally by transnational corporations, the Moss state promises to construct a new form of justice based, based on re redistribution of resource wealth to the indigenous and the poor. This new collective action master frame combines nationalist and anti-imperialist ideologies with natural resource-based demands, drawing on deep collective memories. The 2003 gas war was the most dramatic development, uh, dramatic expression of this, and the resulting October agenda legitimizes the MASA's national development project, which continues to be based in massive natural resource extraction, especially of hydrocarbons. <coughs> Thus, and, uh, Morales embodies a pro-poor narrative of economic revolution, which these days he's calling economic liberation. This position has enormous emotional weight with Bolivia's poor, especially as it's combined with a very popular system of redistribution, uh, public redistribution through bonus or cash transfers. So how did Morales government build on this hegemonic narrative of state making during the Tiknis crisis? First, it's important to notice that, like all states, the MAS-led state is not a homogenous entity with one single vision or set of tactics. As we carried out our field work, we heard dissent from 
even from mass militants working within state ministries, especially those indigenous intellectuals who had been delegates to the Constituent Assembly and had worked closely with lowland indigenous organizations then. The Minister of Defense, Gloria Chacon, renounced her position after the, Ch the Chaparina violence, and the Defensor del Pueblo issued a harsh critique of it. Yet Morales and his closest advisors put forth a very united front defending the road. In his, in his uh, controversial 2013 book, Vice President Alvaro Garcia Linera argued that the highway would protect lowland indigenous peoples from the rapacious patrimonial, patrimonial hacienda elite and the foreign corporations that currently control the region. To break up their power, he said, the Ma state should retain territorial control over the region in order to provide for the greater good. Quote, in the Amazon then, it is not the indigenous peoples who have taken control of the territorial power as occurred years ago in the highlands and the valleys, but it's the despotic landowner order that predominates the region and has controlled the indigenous organizations, end quote. In this quote, we can see a classic strategy uh, labeling one set of indigenous peoples as good Indians and the other as bad Indians. And here I'm thinking of Charlie Hale's work. Morales frequently used the symbol of the Highland Aymara or Quechua as those pushing forward a modern development agenda. Interestingly, the image of Tupac Atari and the other Highland anti-colonial resistance leaders have become dominant tropes indexing this new modern progressive nation. For instance, the government recently launched a new communication satellite named Tupac Atari and named airplanes in the military airline after Qatari and other revolutionary leaders. This widely distributed poster that you see inaugurates, that inaugurated the satellite has the now familiar pairing of Morales' and Qatari's faces with Qatari's famous words, Volveré y seré millones, I will return and be millions. Probably the culmination of this symbolic pairing was the spectacular <laughs> screening of the film Insurgentes in 2012. Just as the second Tiknes march ended in defeat, basically, and its leaders headed back to the communities in the lowlands to regroup, the grand opening of this film took place in La Paz. And here you see Evo with uh, Jorge Sanjines, the director. The state-funded movie traced indigenous and popular rebellions from the colonial period through the Republican era to the gas and water wars of the early 2000s, leading naturally to its culmination, Morales' triumph. So if the figure of Morales gathers up the virtuous and heroic Andean past with the exciting pushes towards modernity, this is in stark contrast to the ways the Tiknes protesters were represented as living in the past and resisting progress. For instance, Mas peasant leader, union leader, uh, Roberto Coraite suggested that the Tiknes protesters should either accept the road or else stay in clandestinity as indigents remaining as savages. Of course, this obscures the fact that many of the protesters weren't opposed to the construction of the road, but the fact that they hadn't been consulted about its placement or, or the possible environmental consequences. Nevertheless, Morales and allies called the protesters enemies of Bolivia and accused them of being supported by USAID and thus being manipulated <coughs> by the US government. The gendered nature of the mass narrative also became apparent in Morales' public discourses on Tignis. Speaking to his Highland supporters in the coca growing region in 2011, Morales famously urged them to seduce the women of the Tignis to gain support for the highway. Here we see the trope of the passive lowland indigenous woman waiting to be penetrated by the active masculine Andeans. Again, this contrasts with all the images the government put forward of the militant Aymara Quechua woman and anti-colonial insurgents such as Bartolina Sisa and Juana Pasa as well as the many contemporary images of Aymar women using their bodies to block roads during critical moments of the anti-neoliberal protests. The image, the image of Andean masculine power echoes the symbolism evident in the many artistic images of critique that circulated online and papered the country's walls during the controversy. And here you can see the phallic images of the road cutting down, uh, going through the uh, through the, 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 the forest. One popular image shows Morales wielding a phallic shaped chainsaw cutting down a tree. The overarching message of these images is clear that the road is a violent and gendered form of penetration. Such gendered discourses of control through rape, violence, and conquest of lands, of course, harken back to the colonial forms of patriarchal oppression that scholars have so ably described, and many people in Bolivia have commented on that. 
Nikki and I have also previously argued that the discourse of progress and state sovereignty over the lowlands also masked the political economic processes of long-term patterns of land use and racialized laboring structures in the region. The Tiffany's region is part of a large-scale capitalist enterprise connecting zones of production to zones of exploitation, enhancing access to national and international markets that some term an expressway for Brazilian capital. I love this cartoon, forgive me for showing cartoons, but for many the Tiffany's project ended up looking more like a sort of familiar model of empire building, but this time with the new empire being Brazil and the resource rich regions like the Amazon providing raw materials for these new nodes in the global marketplace. And we've questioned in the past how lowland indigenous peoples and their labor might once again be positioned at the bottom rung of this large scale development project. The government's narrative of national and regional unity also masked another important fact. Its practices depend on already existing divisions between indigenous communities and organizations. As, the, as part of the process of change that brought Morales to power, highland and lowland groups came together the, to form the Pacto Unidad, the Unity Pact, a, 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 um, a broad-based social movement that advocated for the Constituent Assembly and provided the initial architecture for the new plurinational cons constitution. That delicate alliance began to disintegrate as their visions for indigenous self-determination were replaced in political neg negotiations between the MAS and its opponents on the right with the diluted version of indigenous rights that we see in the current constitution. Shortly after, many of the intellectuals collaborating with the Pacta left the MAS and issued a provocative manifesto against the direction that the MAS was taking. The Tiffany struggle, though, really marked the definitive rupture of this alliance with many highland organizations backing Morales and the road and most lowland organizations against it. In fact, I would argue that this is one, of, one effect of performatively creating an, an event. The state discourses and the performances around it made it appear that the Tipnis crisis demanded a dualistic ethical decision from the public, and especially from indigenous organizations. Are you for us or are you against us? Are you for national development or are you an obstacle to it? Yet, of course, this opposition didn't reflect the complex politics on the ground during the negotiations over the road. There was a really wide range of positions among lowland indigenous groups. Some leaders opted to use the controversy to improve the situation for their communities, while others were really much more strongly tied to the larger cause of protecting indigenous territories in general or to this, this specifically to protecting Tiffany's. Most importantly, as Krupa and Nugent have suggested, the redemptive unity story of the government masks the violence and fear that underlies state practices. I've already described the repression directed at the marchers in Chaparina in the 2011 march. In 2012, the government took advantage of, and some say inflamed, the conflicts between regional indigenous organizations that emerged in the after the 2011 march. It supported a special assembly of the Sibog membership. This is the lowland indigenous organization. And, um, and in which a new slate of indigenous leaders that were supportive of, who were supportive of the highway and the mosque were elected. And then, in a show of force, the government invaded the Sibog headquarters in Santa Cruz in 2012 with police and tear gas to install the new leaders. The new Cibo president, Melba Hurtado, promised to work with the government towards development for the region. I just want to remind you that after 30 years of um, mestizo presidents that weren't able to hurt Cibo, Cibo was uh, undermined in this very serious way by everyone else, the indigenous president. So during the struggles over Tiknis, the Mosque government was in a privileged position to articulate its position through its many political performances. Yet the Tiknis activists were also able to present their own narratives as a result of the massive media attention the case received. I now turn to their efforts to demonstrate how they used many of the same symbolic elements to construct very different figurations. Again, I want to emphasize how the multiplicity of perspectives that abounded in lowland communities was obscured to produce a figure of a noble group of good Indians bravely resisting the state and defending the environment. This figuration paints the situation in black and white terms, characterizing those in favor of the road as traitors to the indigenous cause or as bought off by the government. Oh, there's, there's a picture of Melva after she was um, put in 
So since the 1980s, the Wheat Pala flag has been a critical symbol of indigenous resistance, particularly for indigenous peoples. But during the marches, and in the many demonstrations and graffiti supporting the Tiknis protests, however, the Patuhu flower became a critical symbol of lowland resistance, as well as of Amazonian ecosystems and efforts to protect them. The association between indigenous peoples and nature reinforces the trope of the virtuous eco-Indian and also works to link indigenous interests with the larger concerns for the environment and global climate. As the battle over the Tignes raged, images of beautiful and vulnerable nature abounded in the massive poster production online and on the walls across the country. You can see here, um, uh, you can see indigenous people along with nature, um, unironically. Um, one iconic image that I'm going to pause for a minute on um, was a poster that re reads, Is this really progress? Let's save the Tignes. The image shows, as you can see, the lush Amazonian forest cut through by a highway. A huge leopard lies dead in the foreground, run over by an SUV. So here we see nature as represented by the tragic leopard, and that stands in for the indigenous people of the Tignes. The body of the lowland Indian and the Mother Earth are semiotically linked, tugging on the heartstrings of the audience. In a 2013 article, Nikki and I have described how this wounded Indian, wounded earth narrative provided an opportunity for the regional elites in the lowlands to forge critical alliances with lowland indigenous people. As part of their larger campaign to destabilize the political power of the Morales regime, which they see as a threat to their traditional political and economic hegemony, the Santa Cruz uh, Civic Committee, and here you see a press conference for, of, the, of the Comité Civico, uh, held a press conference decrying the violence committed against the Tiknis protesters as human rights violations. Uh, in 2012, Nikki and I attended a, uh, a regional cabildo, or a mass public meeting in the lowland capital of Santa Cruz, where elites incorporated the Tiknis struggle into their struggle for regional autonomy. This was held in the big um, uh, uh, stadium in Santa Cruz. The, the Tiknis representative, Jose Antesana, who you see here, spoke to the, a cheering crowd saying, we have come as citizens to demand respect for democracy. It's the right and obligation of all of us Bolivians to defend this national park so that they don't destroy it with the highway the government wants to construct. But we're going to defend this territory, I assure you brothers. The highway is not going to pass through Tignes, even if the government insists. This territory belongs to us. It's our right. We have legal title. Here Antisano personifies the wounded Tignes Indian and the wounded, wounded land that is victimized by violations of both human rights and the rule of law. The regional elites happily link their cause to his, benefiting from what uh, Nikki and I have called his aura of victimhood. The elites see the region of Santa Cruz as a territorial body wounded by Morales' politics, that wound that is echoed by the bodies of the many opposition hunger strikers who protested the state in 2008 in their struggles for departmental autonomy. In this view, both the wounded Indian and the wounded Santa Cruz elites see themselves as evidence of Morales' anti-authoritarianism. Uh, so if Morales used patriarchal and gender discourses to push through the TV project, the protesters also used images of women to create a particular vision of indigeneity. Lowland indigenous women were often strategically placed at the very beginning of the protest marchers, mothers and culture bearers marching to protect their children's human rights. But the marches increasingly featured women as leaders as well. In 2011, Justa Cabrera, the Guarani leader of Senamib, the women's organization within Sido, struggled to bring the voices of indigenous women an, into public view. In 2012, the Tiknis March president was Berta Bejarano, and she was increasingly thrust into the spotlight. A 47-year-old Mojeño activist, she was joined on the march by six of her 10 children. The televised images of these women standing up to the mass state telegraph the strength of lowland indigenous women as well as the movement in general. Yet scholars make clear that women's struggles, particularly in the lowland areas, are, are far from over in local communities where women are often silenced and discriminated against, particularly in the, in the political arena. 
Thus, the Tiffany's performances showed only one side of the indigenous women's struggles, again reproducing dominant and one-dimensional narratives of gender. Nikki and I have echoed these critiques about, about this representation, but we also want to suggest that the compelling images of women suffering during the march performed important semiotic work. It tied the unmarked everyday struggles of rural indigenous life, what Povinelli would call the quasi-events, or merely endurance, to the monumental sacrificial event of the, of the march. As a result of these performances, people who would normally not care or take responsibility for the precarious situations that these indigenous mothers live in as their lands are invaded by forest companies, mines, or colonizers, suddenly found themselves forced to take an ethical position on the Tiffany's crisis. One important way this effect was amplified was through the work of La Paz-based feminist group Mujeres Criando, whose performances reinforced the eventfulness of the Tiffany's marches. Mujeres Creando is an anarcho-feminist collective made up primarily of middle-class mestiza intellectuals who participate in a range of feminist and anti-poverty work. It's important to note here that their organizing work takes place mostly in urban areas far removed from the daily struggles of rural indigenous people, so it's a little hard to know the extent to which the Tiffany's protesters felt connected to this urban-based intellectual movement. Nevertheless, Mujeres Creando carried out important acts of, of performative solidarity with the Tiffany's marchers in the process poking fun of the government's hegemonic story. And this is an example of, the, of Mujeres Creando's wonderful gra graffiti that's all over the country, but particularly in La Paz. In 2011, Mujeres Creando sprayed city walls with bright red paint representing the blood of Tiffany's and painted graffiti on city walls critiquing the Chaparina attacks. Then they create a massive street mural welcoming the Tiffany's protesters as they arrived in La Paz in September of 2012. At the top, they sprayed it, painted, as you can see, Soy Tiffany's, and below they created three life-size masks, compelling examples of what I think Hairway might recognize as cyborg figurations. The first mask, as you can see, is a tiger or a cheetah, and the text reads, with animal skin, with animal force, with animal ferocity, I am struggle. The second is a big green face with frogs. Um, and it reads, with the green of plants, lungs to enable us to breathe, scream, sing, and live, I am hope. And the last mask reads, with the blue of water, the principal element of life, to stick out the tongue thirsty for justice, for laughter, for liberty, I am liberty. Interestingly, the accompanying text for this mask explains that this is not an anthropological or, or folkloric imitation of the use of the inhabitants of the Tiffany's make of masks. Mujeres Criando says, we have allowed ourselves to make other different masks, imagined from the ideas and sentiments that they are contributing on each of the days of their march. It's imagination that connects us. In these masks, Mujeres Criando, I think, created a new imaginary figuration that they hope would inspire both the Tiffany's protesters and the residents of La Paz. They blended images of the dominant narrative produced by the Mas and Lolan indigenous uh, protesters. On the one hand, that, that, that indigenous people are savages or close to nature, and on the other, the power of social movement resistance. The transformative power of mass was clear in the last of Mujeres Criando's performance that I'm going to describe today, the March of the Bertas in 2012. During the second march, the government had vilified the march's leader, Berta Bejerano, bringing, bringing up her past drug trafficking charge. Mujeres Creando took up her cause, and in July 2012, when the second march finally arrived in La Paz, Mujeres Creando led a march into Plaza Murillo, the plaza that har houses the parliament. These protesters carried signs that said, I don't know if you can read, for the dignity of women, and we are all Berta. The participants held up masks, uh, life-size photos of Berta Bejerano's face, forming masks that they wore over their own faces and putting on their, on their hats. And then, as the police intercepted them uh, they, and held up their shields, women pasted the photos on the police shields. And you can see Maria Dalindo um, pasting a poster onto the police shields, not endearing herself to the police. Um, eventually, the police denied them entry to the plaza, tear gassed them, and sprayed water cannons at them, drenching them and all their belongings in freezing cold water. 
This was a particularly violent tactic given the difficulty these women from the tropics have in the frigid winter of Highland La Paz. Nevertheless, Mujeres Creando Maria Galindo conclude, concluded that the march was successful as it brought Highland and Lowland women together in protest while Morales sought to divide and, and conquer. I describe these creative performances because, I don't want to leave that poster, what have I got next? Yeah, I'll put it there. We don't want to look at the water cannon any longer. I describe these creative performances because they show again how the Tiknis case became a site for very different political actors, each pushing their own angles and interests. I have great respect for Mujeres Criando, and I see their performances as compelling attempts to provide an alternative vision of the environment, the relationship between indigenous peoples, and gender relations. Yet, I think it's also possible to see their acts of solidarity, in which they claimed we are all Berta, as in fact producing the same sorts of dualisms that the state and the right-wing uh, right elite also did. In what ways might this claim ignore the specific gendered inequalities that existed in rural indigenous communities like Tiki's? Of course, this re returns us to those age-old questions that have bedeviled feminism about which women can speak for all women and who, are, who is the we in, in, in We Are Alberta. But my larger point is that each of these actors, the mas, the right, the feminists, claims that the good indigenous people of the Tiknis belong to their virtuous half of a duality. The Mas state says, says they are part of the progressive, modern, plurinational state development project. The right says they are part of a collective wounded victims of the authoritarian state. And Mujeres Criando says they are part of a radical feminist project pro protesting the masculinist Mas state. While Tiknis residents might share some or part of these diff different agendas, it's doubtful that their positions can be dis distilled down this simply. But as I've pointed out, indigenous people aren't dupes in this representational battle. As I've shown, they themselves have created their own dualisms, claiming that they were part of the human rights project as well as the environmental project to save Mother Earth. In their resistance discourse, in essence, they are saying we are Mother Earth. Thus, each of these groups performs a we that incites the audience to ethical acts, supporting the government and the road, fighting the evil state by embracing regional identity, struggling against patriarchy, or saving the planet and the forest by defending Tiknis. Perhaps these, these very dualisms are necessary for movements to rally support and gain international traction. Once the narrative becomes too complicated, uh, perhaps it's harder to get the public to be moved to action. So let me conclude. Prior to the Tiknis, the Mas, I think, had done a remarkable job of using social movement strategies and embodied performances to legitimize reforms and to gain popular support. That appears to have perhaps reached its limit, as we have just seen in the recent referendum and uh, that everyone almost just lost. But, um, but I think the, the Tiknis controversy shed light on the tensions within this dominant narrative making clear that the Bolivian state was willing to sacrifice lowland peoples to a model of development based on natural resource extraction, and honestly, that a majority of Bolivians would support the state at that point, even if they did sacrifice uh, lowland indigenous people. But what our analysis of the Tiknis case reveals is not a simple story of hegemonic state versus indigenous resistors described in the, in the international press. Rather, it was a complex negotiation between heterogeneous political actors carefully calibrating their effects, the effects of their performances, bless you, for national and international media. To be sure, the Tiknis protesters used the tools from the sort of global repertoire of protest, right? Marches, signs, massive demonstrations. And the state used the classic tools of state repression, water cannons, and tear gas. But even these were not just routinized performances. As Bolivians know from past marches and from the water and gas war, social, move, social movement uprisings can, in fact, alter material and structural inequalities and, and, and inequities and overturn governments. And in Bolivia, there's a sense that for all its deficiencies, the state is amenable to the demands of the poor and indigenous people in ways that no other state in Bolivia's history has been. Thus, I think what we observed in the many performances that I've described today is not a mere rejection of the state or a simple resistance to it, but rather an engagement with it, a delicate dance of political negotiation and representation in which all parties maintained or drew nearer to power through their performances of virtuous indigeneity. The Tiffany's performances took on, I think, kind of carnivalesque dimension with, in which all parties were masked as good Indians 
using shared semiotic materials. And here I think we see clear echoes from the folkloric performances of earlier eras where mestizos danced as Indians and indigenous people danced as African slaves and Spanish conquistadores, all culminating in a Catholic mass to mediate and re repress the frightening indigenous other, thanks to our dear friend Tom Abercrombie. Um, so I think thinking back to you know to those sorts of things, this this the Tiffany's performances lead me to two seemingly contradictory conclusions. First, I think the performances in the Tiffany's case show that despite the advances of the plurinational state to overcome it, racism is woven into the fabric of Bolivian society and its extractivist development model, and much of Bolivian politics continues to be a contestation about that, what Rancière would call a litigation of the existential dis uh, disagreements about, about race. So I want to really emphasize that a lot of this is about the existential power of race and racism in Bolivia. But the second point I want to say is that I think indigeneity is a very slippery category that can be claimed and <coughs> performed by many actors with very distinct interests. If indigeneity served, and once again I'm going to use Rancière's terms, as a site of emancipatory politics at the beginning of Morales' administration, I think by the time of the Tiffany's case, it be claimed that these multiple performances of it were less and less believable by everybody involved. Instead of unmasking each other, as every one of these groups claim to do, I think, the Tiffany's actors appear to be using indigeneity uh, as, as what Povinelli calls an ethical substance, that shared but contestable representation around which to frame their disputes, and their disputes about development, environment, and gender, that is, their disputes about politics. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So we move here? I think we move okay. here. Well, um, I did remember my glasses <laughs> after a recent presentation. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to start out by, <clears throat> by thanking uh, Pamela and Edgardo and Catherine for and of course, Clax for <clears throat> organizing this and and uh, and bringing uh, Nancy here for uh, what <clears throat> uh, I regard as a really terrific paper, <clears throat> one that I found uh, to really generate a lot of uh, a lot of ideas. And um, and I'll thank uh, Nancy and her co-authors for having the courage to step onto what is still somewhat of a political minefield in the U.S. Academy, not to speak of the Bolivian one, a aiming to present uh, in the three essays of which this paper is the last, the second one not yet published, is that Just right? Just published. Just published, yeah, okay. Published. A fair and balanced account, if you will, of the controversies surrounding the events of Tietnice and to look closely at the state effects produced by the government as well as to attempt to reveal the kinds of appropriations and inequities that such effects mask. Doing so is tricky, something like walking on eggshells, because we all want to support a government and party that presents itself as a decolonizing, left-leaning, and reformist one, and because a fair and balanced treatment requires nuanced critique not only of the government's opponents but of the government itself. One still does not want to be lumped either by the Bolivian government or by one's progressive colleagues as in the right-wing blanco mestizo oligarchic capitalist bin in the very non-nuanced nuanced binary that both the Bolivian state and its most right-wing cruceño opponents construct in their uh, counterposed rhetorics. <clears throat> so oficialismo the, as the party in power is called in, in Bolivia, is inclined to tar all its critics and opponents with the same brush as tools of the Blanco Mestizo oligarchy and of international capitalism. But those critics and opponents are, in fact, as uh, this uh, paper has made clear, really very diverse. 
There's a hard and racist right for whom the president's biggest failing is precisely what they would call his race. Uh, but even among the so-called Blanco Mestizo minority in the country, who certainly did hold on to political power until Evo's election, there are many supporters and critics of the government and its governing strategies who are of the left and who worked for decades to expand civil society to make it more inclusive laying the groundwork through policies such as Participación Popular, this uh, 1990s uh, transformation of the country, uh, for the emergence of the kinds of social movements that brought Evo to power, ultimately. But opposition to Mas and Evo does not end with the sometimes former Blanco Mestizo oligarchy, as we've seen in the Tipnis case. There's also a deep divide on Mas and Evo among the people who we, from this Anglo-American vantage, call indigenous. And I'm going to expand on, on the problems with, uh, with our calling them that. Um, uh, so reading the paper on which this presentation drew led me to ask what it is that we mean by the term indigenous. Whatever it is, it's often been ascribed to others rather freely by social scientists, including myself, even when, as in Bolivia until the 1990s, it was rejected by almost everyone to whom we applied it as a racist insult, recognized by all as a thinly disguised euphemism that has been around since the 19th century for the much hated term Indio. It's true that the ground has shifted somewhat since the 1990s with respect to the uptake among those formerly called indigenous people who sometimes using one euphemism or another have now begun to self-identify as indigenous or originario uh, um, uh, if not uh, still sticking with campesino or, or rejecting it altogether. It's only some of those people who we easily call that are willing to be uh, to call themselves uh, uh, by such terms. Um, <clears throat> Generally, they've done so in service of one or another political project that requires such self-identification, such as um, the indigenous self-governance programs of Konamak or Sidob, or in order to seek approval of a, a TCO, uh, 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 Tierras Comunarios uh, Originales, or seeking justice under the umbrella of a UN-approved human rights framework that re requires that they make reference to their indigeneity in order to qualify. Unpacking or deconstructing what is indigenous requires us to take seriously the debates within communities and populations so identified as to the propriety of the term. It also requires that we consider not just what has been said in debates, but what has been performed with a keen eye to the kinds of representational politics, or what Haraway calls figurations, um, and uh, there are a lot of other terms that one might use. I think figurations is okay, um, uh, well, that are analyzed in this paper, that of marches and demonstrations, political sloganeering and image making. The paper identifies two generalized figurations of indigeneity appearing in the context of Tipnis, the good Indian and the bad Indian. I find compelling the paper's discussion of these and of what I would call their commutability, the fact that valences can change depending on one's stance in a conflict marked by stark binary contrasts. But I would also add to the mix two counterposed kinds of self-identification as indigenous, which further complicate the picture. One distinction is that of highland versus lowland indigenous person and the other between what I will term communitarian agro-pastoral indigeneity and a new born of Evo and Mas neoliberal indigeneity. It must first be said that in Bolivia until recently identifying who is and who is not indigenous has been almost exclusively the business of people who identify themselves as not indigenous. Along with foreign scholars, anthropologists included, city people calling themselves blancos, criollos, mestizos, or some combination of those terms, were most at ease in identifying indios. And they saw two kinds that could be easily identified. The highland Quechua or Aymara speakers who live in the campo, in the countryside, and who uh, were occupied as peasant farmers and herders, 
and the wild Indians of the lowlands who lived in places like Tipnis. The rural to urban migration migrants who for over 450 years have been a majority on the outskirts of Spanish founded cities were always classed as something else. Initially as Indios Criollos and then as Cholos, kinds of denationalized or denaturalized Indians who had lost their connections to rural communities and who living in an urban way aimed to become moderns to live through commerce or craft or wage labor rather than through communitarian agriculture. If sometimes urban blancos and mestizos called these migrants cholos, they also continued to tar them with the insult term indio, transforming what had been an identifier of nation and a position in relations of production, partly outside of capitalist relations, into a category of race, something now carried in the body and the blood. Cholos were Indians out of place, and yet the distinction prior to that of race also still held. Real and proper Indios were only to be found in the Campo. In the 1980s, when I first did field work in the country and the city in Bolivia, no one in the countryside self-identified as Indio or Indígena, and um, uh, almost all bridled at the term Campesino by the, uh, by the 1980s, it, it had already uh, uh, the, the stigma of, uh, of what it replaced had already seeped into that euphemism. Likewise, in the cities, cholo, in the masculine form at least, was exclusively an insult term that you leveled at other people, no one, no men at least, called themselves that. Since then, from the 1990s really, self-identification as indígena has taken off, though not as widely as outside observers often assume. But it now has an array of meanings which I think can, I can boil down to two, just to simplify. On the one hand, it's been used by those within agro-pastoral collectivities to solidify their colonial charters as common hold communities by claiming designation as TCOs, uh, a convention of the 2009 Constitution. On the other hand, the identification of Evo Morales as indígena has led some rural to urban migrants and migrant cocaleros who are still engaged in agriculture but as private holders rather than in the context of ayus and common hold, very different kind of person, to claim an indigeneity of descent, something of a bodily nature rather than merely a matter of shared language or customs or land title, something quite different. These two ways of claiming indigenous status are of course deeply entangled through family ties between communitarian people and their migrant relatives, and there's a lot of uh, movement back and forth, but they differ in one critical respect, the kind of property relations that characterize them. Much of the debate within the many communities, highland and lowland, that sought TCO titling, uh, and it is very much a force in the Aymara and Quechua highlands, hinged precisely on property relations, Many within those communities might have preferred to acquire private land titles associated with modernity and with the possibility of expansion of holdings and potential inten intensive agriculture, for example, to grow quinoa, which is now worth a lot and, and, and worth intensive agriculture, while others sought to block privatization precisely through the TCO. Sidob and Konamak are tied to the latter trend which has not only promoted traditional and perhaps pre-Columbian forms of communalism through the TCO, but the kind of sovereignty claims that in the 2009 Constitution required prior, prior consultation of TCO members before proceeding in those territories with development schemes, including the signing of contracts for extraction of subsoil resources, not just building highways. Uh, it's about wealth that's underground. Absolutely. Some few activists in urban peripheries, such as El Alto, also argued for extension of TCO-like communalism to their own neighborhoods. But they have been far outnumbered by others seeking to convert squatting rights into legal title, something the Morales government has supported very happily and distributed those titles, much to the delight of the World Bank, which has been pushing them to do that. If there are two kinds of indigeneity,
those promoting shared customs and lands in communal regime and those claiming bodily heritage but eschewing the commons in favor of private property, it might be said that one sort, the TCO-based claim, resembles Marx's primitive communism, while the other, where being indigenous is about a possessive individual's descent, is more in line with a neoliberal agenda. From the perspective of the state, which has indeed promoted extractive capitalism and the extension to urban squatters of titles, the communalist sort of indigeneity can indeed be said to be resisting and hampering state development and impeding the flow of the royalties that have been the source of the country's general financial prosperity and the distributed monies that have brought local development to rural municipalities and that have lifted many out of poverty. From that perspective, the, the communalist TCO opposition to state-led development is an attack on the state's decolonization measures. Much of the international media focus on Tipnis and on indigenous community opposition to mines and oil fields and other kinds of extractive capitalism stems from environmentalist concerns, ours particularly. For those hoping to blunt the advance of the Anthropocene, indigenous people who hope to halt such environmentally destructive development are all good Indians, green ones, in oh, fact. Sure. But in the Bolivia internal context of the Tipnis masks and marches, and the less well-known cases of communal opposition to government-approved mining leases to foreign corporations in highland TCO land, such as uh, Malku Kota, the best known of these, I think, the valences could be made to shift by pointing to the backwardness of the communalists whose efforts to block privatization and development impede the greater progress of the Bolivian people, that is, are counter to the interests of neoliberal indigeneity, the other kind of indigeneity. Now, onto the masks. Most of what I've said so far aims to put the paper's analysis of Tipnis masking into a slightly different and more historical perspective. That's just me. That move is, of course, unfair to the intent of the paper. But it seems to me that full consideration of the semiotics of masked and costume performance in Tipnis requires that we also look at other prior contexts, those that make the masks and costumes intelligible to Bolivian insiders. And the history of such performances hinges mightily on the two distinct binaries that mark how indigeneity has long been embodied in performance. That between highlanders and lowland wild Indians, and that between rural communitarian agro-pastoral collectives, and the rural to urban and highlands to coca colonization zone migrants, whose livelihoods are marked by private property and full integration into capitalist markets. Evo himself, though born in the former kind of place, early on transmuted into the other kind of person uh, is very much the latter kind of an indigenous person and as a cocalero, uh, as a like, more like a rural to urban migrant, which he himself also was. Rural Aymara and Quechua Campesino indigenous communities mark out their fiestas with singing and dancing, sometimes costumed. By far more influential in the Tipnis case, however, are the masked folkloric processional dances of urban patron saint festivals in places like La Paz, Oruro, and Cochabamba. Until the 1950s revolution, such masked dances were performed by well-established descendants of rural to urban migrants, some now calling themselves mestizos, and eager to differentiate themselves from rural indios, uh, organized into guilds and brotherhoods based on their occupations within the urban laboring class. Most of these dances involve the performed figuration or representation or surrogation of alterity, of others not like the performers. Among the most popular of such costumes and masks were depictions of black slaves and of devils and archangels in which the devils were linked to, to the earth beings purportedly worshiped by Indians who were saved from devilish sins by the victory of the archangels. Also very popular in these highland festivities were and are dances in which urban people, often of lowland, um, uh, uh, in, in which urban people represent themselves as lowland wild Indians, such as the Tobas of the Chaco, which is one of the most widely distributed of, of these these dances, and, and in which uh, they begin to look like the wild Indians of U.S. Uh, uh, westerns. In the 1950s, elite Blancos began to join the performances. 
Then through the 1980s and until today, migrants identifiable as from the countryside have joined in the dances and brought new ones including folklorized depictions of rural highland uh, costumes and communities. Finally, starting in 1992, the Association of Syndicalized Highland Communities launched a critique of these urban performances, claiming that they amounted to what we would now call cultural appropriation, and began to perform their own counter processions in their own clothes and performing as members of their own rural communities carrying big banners uh, with the name of the community. To do so, however, they must first learn urban processional performative styles, above all how to perform a spectacle for an audience, and how to transmit the key message in banners and via loudspeakers, which is their municipal identities and the urgency of their quest for recognition and inclusion. The state effect of Carnival on Oruro until they erupted into it cast the nation's goal in redemptive terms as internalizing Indian powers while shedding that same Indianness to become respectable Blanco Mestizo moderns, all the while casting urban indigenous women, that is the so-called cholas, as the temptresses most responsible for pulling the people as a whole down into sinfulness, while only the virgin and the victorious archangel could pull them back into white righteousness. The Anata Andina, as the uh, counter, uh, Carnival o of Oruro is called, is now sponsored by the Bolivian state itself. Tolerated as a secondary procession in every city's folkloric pageant, it's also marginalized to the temporal fringes of the main arena. It may have begun as a protest against such figurations, but it now serves to produce yet another state effect at one and the same time underscoring the city's and the state's toleration of their demands for recognition, making clear the necessity of such acts of supplication, and yet keeping them firmly at the fringe of the national project and of the celebrated folkloric uh, uh, spectacle, um, you know, on a different day, at a different hour, and usually with very little audience, <coughs> which uh, of a national project and the fringe of a national project which requires it seems a redeemed that is neoliberal kind of indigenous person the kind who can remove his or her costume and work as a possessive individual for progress and development all bolivians may now be deeply familiar with the repertoire of figurations by which state effects and contestations of them are choreographed in spectacles such as this and in the massed march, uh, marches of Titnis. But it remains to be seen if decolonization, which I take to be in this context, the ability to, to deconstruct the semiotics of state effects, can decolonize the state itself. And okay, and I just want to end with a, a, a couple of questions, uh, and feel free not to answer them. Uh, we can take some other questions okay. from elsewhere, but. I, I'm just led to wonder, while listening to the, to the talk, um, uh, aren't uh, income redistribution, community controlled development funds, old age pensions, a growing middle class, and the better royalty agreements that are negotiated by the Morales government also state effects? Um, and if so, is it, is it just ideology? I mean, it seems to me that that it's one thing to claim the state is an ideological construct and, an, and another thing to look at what uh, governments do in the name of the state, which is sometimes to hand out money. Um, uh, and if they are state effects, what do they mask, I guess, um, in, in this uh, approach? Um, yeah, and I guess the second, the second question that follows from that, that, that would come from someone more supportive of the Morales government than, than I am right now, I'm, I'm ambivalent, uh, is um, how could all that be achieved without neoliberal resource um, uh, nationalism? That is, without, ex uh, uh, without uh, uh, selling rights to extractable resources and taking royalties from them. Uh, and, uh, okay, and uh, another question, what about sovereignty? It's just generally, what about sovereignty? It seems to me that, that the demands of the TCOs have much to do with that and to their effort to, uh, 
at autonomy, at self-governance, and, um, and also ultimately to have control over what happens to their resources. Mm -hmm. Something as a centralizing uh, state uh, uh, doesn't necessarily want to give into, but it is written into the Constitution, but that's one of the things that hasn't been delivered. Um, and, and finally, just one really side note. The, uh, the new form of the TCO, and I can't remember, TIOC, mm -hmm. Tierras Indígenas Originarios Campesinos, Campesinos just to throw in uh, a wider range of euphemisms so that more people can join, right? These are all euphemisms, originario um, coming from the, the um, kind of Canadian context, I think, from the First Peoples, um, uh, but also has resonance with a term that has uh, uh, long been uh, understood in uh, in, uh, in the in indigenous parts of the country. There, I use that word um, uh, as uh, uh, distinct from forasteros. So there were, you know, uh, tributaries through the 19th century, paid um, uh, a high rate or a low rate depending on. Some of them called themselves originarios, and sometimes they had more land, and and others of them who had arrived from outside paid less and were called outsiders. So to be originario was better and you had higher status and, okay. Um, uh, which might have made it uh, attractive. Uh, and that's it, that's, that's all my That's questions. it. <laughs> yeah. Great, well thank you so much for the great comments, the interesting, interesting questions. If, if you don't mind if I respond to him first before we take some more questions, because you brought up so many interesting uh, comments. I, uh, not all of which I can respond to now. It'll take, take us another hour to respond to them all. I want to just bring up a couple things. First, I like your idea about the two different kinds of indigenous people that sort of the rural campesino based in collective or communal ideas uh, or practices and the more urban, what you're calling a neoliberal indigenous person. And I think that's really important. Um, I've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years thinking, uh, working on um, the idea of class, and that's something we haven't really talked about here today. I mean, w when we're thinking about whether indigeneity is a relevant category of organizing anymore, I think on the one hand, yes, we've seen this real confusion over the last period of time because there are radically different political economy practices of people and radically different relations to the market and to and to the and to the economy. And I think what that's created is. Um, and I've, I'm arguing this, Nikki and I are writing yet another paper together in which we're thinking about, we're calling it Beyond Indigeneity, because we're really recognizing that in many parts of, of the Bolivian uh, 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 society, indigeneity or even uh, identity, it, uh, indigenous identity is becoming less salient site of organizing than it used to be. Not to say that people aren't, don't still feel themselves to be Aymara or Guarani or whatever, but it's just a less relevant question for them. And perhaps it's because these are people who are firmly in your category, your second category, your, your neoliberal category. Think about the census, the recent census in 2012, the, the number of people who self-identified as indigenous went down from somewhere in the 60s percent to somewhere in the 40 percent. And there have been tons of people thinking about why that might be, you know, was it the, the way the question was asked, was it um, uh, uh, there are a number of, of critiques of the, of the census process, but some of the most compelling arguments that I found were that for, for most people these days, indigeneity in fact still refers to your first category. You're that category of people who live out there in the campo, who still are on the land, um, and and the, for those those rural to urban migrants, they still consider themselves to have an indigenous heritage. But they don't. If you ask them to check that box, they're just not going to. They're they're Aymara or they're urban migrants or whatever. <coughs> so for those people, indigeneity is not as relevant of a of a of a category for organizing as class is. I think that's an interesting argument. And, and in fact, in the census, you saw the places in Bolivia where indigeneity still, uh, p people identify themselves very strongly, are in fact places where they're under, under stress, under, um, they're doing battle with the government to keep hold to, of their territory over natural resources, like the Tipnis and like other places where they're trying to control that, control that land. So I like your, your categor categorization, and I, so I would, 
accept your amendment and then go even farther to say let's start thinking let's throw class back into there into the into the definition of, of indigeneity because I think it's something that's really uh, important another um, uh, uh, amendment to the amendment I would make is you one of the things that you suggested is that those folk who are living and working in more communal uh, uh, conditions um, the pastoral forager etc group that they in fact offer a challenge I don't th I think they can um, I, over the last five years I've been uh, studying and, uh, and following the case of Charagua in the Guarani uh, co uh, community in the Chaco which is one of the 11 communities that's been trying to accomplish, if the Tiox is the new language for uh, territory, the new, ter uh, the new language for aut local indigenous autonomy is Ayok, uh, an indigenous uh, originary campesino autonomy. And it's a new category that the Constitution has created. There are a lot of bureaucratic obstacles to jump through it, and only 11 uh, municipalities over the, these years have been able to do it. Only two have been able to get to the referendum, and only one ha was, has passed, and that's Charagua, the place that I've been following. And what's fascinating about it is that it is definitely a community of people who are organizing around, the ter around territory, are as collective, and identifying themselves as indigenous, strongly in uh, indigenous, and trying to gain self-determination and self-government. But they're not really posing that big a challenge to the natural resource extractivist project or to the big capitalist project. They're not, they're, they're grabbing hold of decolonization and plurinationalism and indigenous autonomy as a way to control their local government, but what are they doing? They're still, most of the money that's coming in through them is from hydrocarbon money. That's how they're going to fund their, their autonomous uh, city and their, and their autonomy government. So they're not going to necessarily pose a challenge. They could, and that's what I've been trying to you know, observe over these last five years is, is, is that. Um, so that's the question of sovereignty, too. That's the, that's the big question I've been writing and thinking about over the last couple of months is what does sovereignty mean? In the, the, the indigenous challenge at the, indig at the Constituent Assembly through the Pacto Unidad and through the, you know, their proposals was that they really were offering a, a substantial challenge to the liberal nation state. They were, offer they were proposing a form of self-government government and, and self uh, you know, determination that would call for shared decision making on uh, on uh, natural natural resources, using of usos y costumbres not just to you know decide not just on you know local cr criminal questions but on big political and economic questions about what kind of development. But even that those proposals, those actual challenges to national sovereignty, got pretty much decimated by the in the constituent assembly process. The, the, the Constitution, even indigenous autonomy, which again is the last vestige of that, of the Pacto's proposal, is, a, is, a, a, is subsumed within a centralized state. The centralized state continues to have almost all the decision-making power about natural resources. And so what autonom indigenous autonomy is going to end up being in, in, the, in the Bolivian case is a kind of municipal, like a multicultural municipality that gets to make some decisions about development, but within the context of this larger na uh, liberal nation state that ha continues to have control. So sovereignty is the big question. What, what, is, what does it mean? And in that case, what does, ind what does indigeneity mean if the kind of sovereignty that people are going to assert as, as indigenous autonomies through this IOC process is really about how to channel um, uh, uh, hydrocarbon money into their, into their community? That, that's just so different from what we thought this was going to look like. But if you look around the world, think about New Zealand. That's what the Maoris are doing. That they think that's 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 national sovereignty. They own, they're stakeholders in the energy corporations that dammed up all their rivers, and they make lots of money off of it. You know, I was on a panel in Chile with one with a, a Maori scholar, and the people in in Chile were just stunned. You know, that's indigenous autonomy as being a stakeholder in the energy company. So who knows? Maybe that's what we're what we're what we're, we're, what we're coming to, in the Bolivian case. So, um, okay, I will open up to other questions. I I still have a lot more questions. Uh, things to respond to yours. Uh huh. Thank you. Um, 
คือ I ช่วยการการเรียนการเรียนเรื่องอะไรโมเดลแต่ฉันอยากถามคำถามคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณคุณ
things have really shifted significantly over the decades. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So in the 1980s, um, if you think about the trade union movement, there used to be very sharp distinctions between workers and peasants. And Indians uh, or Aymara and Quechua or ethnic identity was really seen as somewhat marginal. And as the uh, trade union movement was uh, took its blows from neoliberalism, um, in the Sesut Sebe, in the peasant trade union movement, you could see the Aymara, Quechua, ethnic um, identity as taking over and gaining ground mm -hmm. where um, earlier uh, peasant and worker sorts of identification were collapsing. And then with the mobilizations in the last decade, it seems to me that in indigen indigenous identity, Aymara, Quechua, what I mean, acquired a kind of centrality that was really yeah. very novel historically. Up until that time, proletarian centrality was, was uh, the main feature of the trade union movement. But all of a sudden, some kind of indigenous identity that had once been seen as so marginal acquired mm -hmm. uh, a new kind of uh, prominence. And then what's so interesting now is that, uh, because in that period during the mobilizations, 2000 on, up, up through the early first years of the one of this, uh, government, it seemed that many different people could claim some sort of indigenous identity yeah. across different class and urban, rural divisions uh, so that workers could claim to be Aymara or Quechua mm -hmm. and people who previously would have been uh, tagged as peasant and colonizadores um, right. would also start identifying as Aymara or Quechua as Evo did himself. Right. And then, so interesting to see what's happening now as that kind of unity around some sort of indigenous identity has begun to break down. Right. Mm -hmm. Why different reasons the state is trying to co gain control over indigenous organizations that want to have more autonomy, uh, or the battle over the, the community lands, et cetera, that peasants or colonizadores mm -hmm. also want claims to. So all these sorts of divisions have opened up again right. in the aftermath of the in, in uprisings. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so it's a very historical thing. It yeah. seems it's it depends on what region you're talking about. It also depends on the historical moment. And just to get at a more specific point, is the last one that came up uh, here about the colonizadores. Um, I'm wondering if you've done research in the Tiknis with colonizadores and looked at the kinds of the ways in which colonizadores and community uh, members relate to one another marry, uh, um, intermarry, um, identify. Um, I mean, the, the colonizadores who I had some contact with would, in the 2000s, would say, yes, we are Aymara, we are Quechua. This is what our language is, this is what our parents spoke, mm -hmm. etc." There was a kind of identification. But then you also cited the case of the, of the one uh, peasant leader who called the Tiki's Indian savages, right? So I'm I'm curious to know about the Tiknis, uh, the colonizador identity in particular, mm -hmm. and how they are relating on the ground in the Tiknis region to the community members. I sure wish I could answer that, but I, I can't. I have not worked with the colonizadores at all. Um, I have uh, I've read a couple of really great um, d PhD dissertations and about about those those folks, but none of them have have a have answered that question. So I really, I really can't answer answer the questions about it. But I wouldn't be surprised if, over this uh, recent period, as we're seeing um, kind of a, a, a rising middle class in the urban areas, we're also seeing a rising middle class among the cocaleros in Cochabamba, in the Tiknis. I mean, everybody's talking about how much money is circulating in the in the. Uh, in the Yungas and particularly in the, you know, in the in, in the Tropico Cochabambino, the, I think that there's probably a, a, a range of identifications now, and people marrying across classes and across across ethnic groups. I would not be surprised by that. Things have really shifted. I, it, things have just really shifted over the last ten years, and uh, so I wouldn't be surprised. What do you think, Tom? Do you know? I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, as far as the uh, colonizadores go, but uh, certainly that that things have shifted, and in the the, the area that I know have, have followed more more closely in the the Highlands, I mean it's it's certainly the case that in all of the every one of these TCOs was uh, that, that emerged there was the product of a bitterly contested disputation within the community itself. N the, none of them were you know, voted in with 95% majorities. And there was always a pretty significant minority in the cases that it passed, and in some of them it was defeated, th this proposal, um, who uh, refused to join in and refused to join in because they had a different vision of themselves in, th in the future that did not require them to be indígenas and originarios and that um, uh, would make it possible for them to pull out the private land titles that very many in those uh, uh, those communities that still have um, a collective title, very many of them over the uh, decades and over the last three or four generations have gone to the Reforma Agraria and its uh, you know and its new versions to get uh, private land titles drawn up by a land judge, and they're waiting for the moment in which they can have them enforced. And that moment is when the majority of their peers aren't going to stone them to death mm -hmm. if they try to. To do it right, so uh, and and it just happens that that the last decade has given many uh, a real reason to try to do that, which is quinoa. It's actually the sale price of of quinoa that makes it really reasonable and feasible to produce uh, intensively to buy a tractor, but you need a big extension of land to make the tractor feasible. You need to buy up some other people. You need and you, you know you want more secure title over the land in order to, and, and uh, there are certainly places in the Altiplano where that is on the increase, where the expansion of, of some rich former campesinos who now have uh, pretty big lands and have big tractors to, to work them is, is producing a kind, kinds of class divides, and others where you have cooperatives that have forestalled that. So um, all kinds of things going on uh, really owing to that. We've got a couple more questions. Um, I just want to add one other thing to this comment, and that is thinking about the, in, the uh, indigenous autonomy of municipalities. Uh, of the 11 that went forward, a number of them have just been stalled and stopped. You know, the, like the, the places that you would be, you know, really, Jesus de Machaca, right? Where you thought that they would just immediately go forward. And part of the reason why they're so stalled because people have really different ideas about collective land holdings, about forms of indigenous governance, and whether they really think that it's going to be effective these days. And a lot of that has to do with what kind of money is going to come in and, 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 and how, through this, either through the state, through farming, through this. So it's really surprising. It's surprising. OK, so we've got one, two, two, and then three. Yes. Yeah, so was, uh, I'm interested in knowing how whether and how international NGOs involved in environmental issues have been involved with this. As you mentioned, there's imagery there. You can see on iconography, rhetoric, which is used globally mm -hmm. in the environmental movement. So I'm wondering about that kind of an exogenous factor here, which, which I think relates to issues of uh, self-determination, mm -hmm. autonomous expression, mm -hmm. as well as you know, um, Indigenous mo movements globally, or, or elsewhere in South America, mm -hmm. as an exogenous factor. He's asked whether what's the role of international NGOs, particularly in the environmental case. Um, I'll start by saying that in, uh, Bolivian NGOs ha uh, are really strong and uh, have just fabulous intellectuals making you know great claims. So I, I, I just don't want us to, you know, to think that international NGOs have you know, come in and, um, and uh, influenced them greatly. I think they're, you know, all of the environmental NGOs have, uh, you know, are, uh, have, ha have alliances with international NGOs. But uh, my, my sense is, is that even in the Tipnis case, the majority of the, of the production of, of these images and the majority of the um, of the arguments was very much domestic. And I want to say also that in the Bolivian case, it's really hard for NGOs to be connected with international NGOs under in, a, in the present climate. 
the, the, the Morales government has been very critical of international NGOs. And so the, you know, the, the, the NGOs that I, that I interview every summer, they hardly talk to people in the, in the foreign world because they're really scared. They're scared. You know, last summer, uh, Evo made very clear, Evo and Alvaro made very clear announcements that any NGO that made any arguments about their new uh, easing of, res of environmental restrictions were going to get kicked out of the country. And, uh, you know, the, their new uh, Agenda 2025, which calls for an increase to the agrarian frontier, you know, allow, you know the new rules that allow extractivist uh, resource um, uh, development to go into protected areas and indigenous areas, all these terrible, shocking changes, everybody's had to be very quiet about it because people, the NGOs are really scared. So, you know, after the, after the Tiffany's, after everybody was tarred with this, oh, you're just, um, uh, you're, you're a, a, a puppet of, the, of USAID or you're a puppet of the US Embassy, people are very, very careful about that. I don't know, do you guys, does anybody here have any, anything else to say about that? I haven't done ethnography inside NGOs. I've only interviewed people, so I, can't, I really, you know, I can't, this is what I, my answer is really my, my anecdotal thoughts about it, so I really can't tell you. I've, I've, I mostly work with indigenous organizations and not with the NGOs, I've, so I, I don't want to give a definitive answer. Anybody else here have a better response? Anybody working with NGOs in Bolivia? No? No. Okay. Ma'am? Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, Paloma, go ahead. Um, first of all, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm just, I, I'm curious because you've used the word, the word semiotic a mm. couple of times, and we've seen specifically from anthropology, um, scholars engaging with, the, in the, working in the Indian region and the Amazon that are using, uh, Charles Peirce's work uh -huh. and talking about semiotics in a way that helps them think about race, but also uh, anthropo anthropology beyond the human and thinking about the, the nature and culture in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and also drawing on Donna Haraway's mm -hmm. work. So um, I was just curious to know if you are, if you were hinting to those, mm -hmm. um, to the to that type of inquiry, or if you're engaged with that kind of thinking, or because they are also thinking about politics. Yeah. Um, or trying to, to use it to think about politics. Mm -hmm. So I was just cur curious to know what's your relationship right now. I am not a person. Uh, I have a colleague, David Peterson, who has been trying to convince me to be a person uh, for about 15 years, and I, res I resist. <laughs> so when I'm using that term, I'm not using it in a person sense. I'm really using it more in a sort of more symbolic sense, you know, in a, in a, in a similar. I've been, I've been thinking more about ritual and, and performance, much more sort of Diana Taylor kind of uh, performance work and not so much person. Are you conv are you gonna convince me I ought to? <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> all right. We've got one more back there, and then all right, all right. Do you use purse? Sorry to ask for the for again, but just to the question that was asked about the colonizadores. Uh, from what I understand. Two, it was uh, the group colonizador was not seen as appropriate for the mass and for the Cocadro movement because of the or the whole discourse of the uh, decolonization. It was contradictory. So I understand that the word that they prefer was interculturalis. That, that, that was the word that, that, that they used. I mean, I mean, I get from people going to the to the, what was the word? To the tropics. Interculturals. Oh, interculturals. Yeah. That's another question. And just to finish, I mean, I, I mean my, my last name is Mamani. That's a really, very basic uh, Aymara or Quechua last name. And, you know, like, there is like a. Uh, this this text really interesting because my, my father was an Aymarista, which means like promote the language and the, and the culture. And one of the first ambassadors uh, who was Aymara in this government, uh, his name is Eugenio Poma in Aguaya. He was in my community and he was sent to Denmark. He used to teach Aymara in Chicago. So this is really illustrates what the country is about, you know. He went to, when his first son was born, he went to the consulate of Bolivia, near, nearby, and when the, and he, they, there was a space that was for race, 
and he said, you know, uh, he, he asked him, put, uh, put, put down a matter. Uh, and the, and the office, officer said, like, no, he's, uh, he's now going to be educated. He, you can, we cannot put down a matter. Maybe the father said, uh, the, the mother is a matter, the father is a matter, but the kid is a matter. But the Imam Badoi or uh, the, uh, officer or concert officer said, no, he will be educated. Now he's a step forward, you know, he's kind of saying that he's civilized. <laughs> Just to share that, thank you. Superado. <laughs> Enrique. I think Enrique wants to speak. Yeah. This comes from the Peruvian, Bolivian border, but it's actually on the Bolivian-Brazilian border, so mm -hmm. that brings up a fairly amount of interesting questions. I think the, there is a new thing coming up, which is the tropics. Mm -hmm. and its inhabitants and its colonizers and its colonial backers mm -hmm. and its resource extractors mm -hmm. right? and its NGOs and its anthropologists that follow suit. And sort of listening to your Dignis case, which I've been following in the newspapers but not in detail, I was struck with a similar huge catastrophe disaster that occurred in Peru, which is called the Bagua case, right. mm -hmm. where the previously quiet and unnoticed jungle Indians, who by now have changed themselves, their names three times in their indigen mm -hmm. indigeneity so that they can be interlocuted by the state. You know, who are you? Mm -hmm. right. So mm -hmm. these people used to be Awarunas, now they're Awahun, and they're in alliance and so on and so forth. So I think what you're seeing in the Dignis case and in this Bagua case is a new actor mm. trying to find how to talk, negotiate, uh, organize, march, uh, politicize, occupy uh, politically their way in which these territories are being incorporated. Mm -hmm. Under beyond neoliberalism, it's just sort of being extracted, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that was my, my comment in general. Mm -hmm. So that uh, the Aymara and Quechua Highland Campesino discussion of that is a different region and a different older discourse. It goes back to colonial times, as Tom and I very well know, uh, and this is new. Mm -hmm. right? So my question since is also, since this is facing the, Bra the Brazilian side, mm. And the Brazilians also very autocratically dominate their Indians through their funai mm -hmm. and have an even more stronger neoliberal attack on their jungles. Uh, the issue is what's <coughs> going to happen on the Brazilian mm -hmm. side of that same frontier. Mm -hmm. And yes, of course, the way they have to negotiate with that kind of state yes. and which way these states are going to respond. So yeah. I. I, I thank you for bringing this up. Thank you, thank you. Well, interestingly, um, one of the things that happened after the Tipnis, the 2011, um, the Chaparina intervention on the first march, the first Tipnis march, um, is that um, because the Morales government got such a bad press about doing that, in fact, the Brazilian Development Bank that was funding the Tipnis <coughs> case pulled out, precisely because they'd already gotten such bad press about the way that they were dealing with their indigenous communities and the local Amazonian development projects, they didn't want to get their hands tarred by this new mess. And it was a kind of an interesting thing to see the Brazilian government pulling back from the, you know, from the Bolivian government. You, you think, wow, Evo, you must have really screwed up if the Bol Brazilians are pulling away from, from you on that front. But I think it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, the, 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 lo the lowland indigenous people in, in, uh, in, in, in Bolivia are, are, are facing the, the continued extractivist project. That's not changing. In fact, it's going full force. There's the you know the the, the Morales government has has pushing forward in the in the plan 2025 with increased agrarian uh, you know pushing back the agrarian uh, frontier, expanding it. They're going to go from I think they have like 10. I'm horrible at numbers. I don't know if it's 10 million, 10,000, whatever the, the the number is that they're they're going to triple the amount of hectares in 
cultivation over the la over the next 15 years, the next 10 years, and they're going to you know push that through indigenous territories, preserved er uh, areas, and and national parks. The, all of those are going to be opened up, um, and uh, and they're they're going to continue to push forward with, with hydroelectric power. They want to be the hydroelectric. A center, the, the energy center for the region. So that means hydroelectric dams and and um, and and, and uh, uh, mines, uh, iron mines. The Hutuan mines didn't go through, but it's still in the in the possible offering. And then there are all these new dams, the Cachuela Dam. And then there's the lithium question. The li I know you were interested in hearing a little bit about the lithium. Um, that's going forward, and even though the, the you know the Salar de Uyuni is one of the most fragile environmental areas in in the Bolivian highlands, you probably know more about that area than I do, Tom. But you know they're they're going forward, and they're already making um, projects. They've got Chinese and I think uh, I believe it's German uh, joint partnerships to they you know they already have uh, they're already extracting lithium from the Salar, and they're going to start making batteries, and eventually the hope is to make. Uh, cars. So the, the, the extractivist project is going full bore. There, there has been no stopping at all. No, Tiffany's didn't stop it. There was, it was just a momentary pause. It's going full, 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 forward full bore and for the most part most Bolivians appear to be 100 percent behind it. The, the lowland indigenous peoples are uh, you know that are whose la lands and and territories are going to be sacrificed in this process don't have much support in Bolivia, and the NGOs that have have been supporting them are being silenced. So it's a really scary time for for lowland people. Their hearts were absolutely broken by Tipnis. They you know my Guarani friends, even the ones in Charagua who have just won this indigenous autonomy and are you know really excited about that, their hearts were just broken. They literally start crying when they when they talk about Chaparina because it was such a betrayal that the indigenous president, you know, could do this and then take over Sidob and now and like what 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 legs do we have to stand on, say the people from the lowlands? It's a very different view of Bolivia from my Guarani friends than it is from the highlands, from Potosi, from anywhere. It's really a moment of, of real desperation because of because of, of this you know, this extractivist project. Pamela? Should be the last question. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, you know, hearing you all uh, ask these questions makes me think of the the movement in, in a larger sense. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes me think of the, the emerging alliances uh, that would sort of like speak to to what could be done. And um, mm. Sinclair and I had um, women from Senami and mm. from Conamac a year ago, right? Um, here, yeah. talking about Tidnis and talking about um, the ways in which they are uh, dealing with that. And that reminded me also of the way you were, Tom, and you were talking about, you know, this communal sort of collective action of recuperation of Ailu territories and versus the sindicatos. This sort of like uh, tension was always there mm -hmm. from the get-go before Evo, for, for a long time now, right? So the larger movement, I'm trying to think beyond Evo and the larger movement, although Evo represents that syndicalismo that really was able to link syndicalismo with party building, the mass now, and state building, right? Which is the what we're seeing now, sort of like this extractivist project, sort of being very dominant and sort of um, uh, opacando this other alliance-making processes that are trying to do something different, which is goes gets me gets me back to the women mm. that came here and said, you know, we're aligned and we're mm. slowing down. <laughs> One thing I think that's really happened is that the class structure of Bolivia has changed. We were talking about this yesterday. You know, it used to be that uh, the 
white mestizos were the upper and middle class and indigenous people were the working class and the campesinos. That's changed. That's really changed. So in terms of going forward, I think we have to rethink you know, what indigeneity means, who's aligning with whom. There's, this, there's a, a new middle class, or a new working class. Um, you know, so I don't know what, how, how things are go going to go forward, but I, I do think we really have to rethink the class structure of Bolivia. Um, I don't know, what do you think, Tom, in terms of going forward and, and organizing things? No, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, uh, I, I guess I'm shocked when I think back at all the ethnographies I've read and, and histories of, of, uh, about, the, uh, about the region, about how cavalier everyone always was about identifying who's indigenous. It was really easy. You, know, you went out the countryside and they were, there they were. They were the indigenous people with very little querying about self-identification and uh, how people uh, identified themselves and what they saw as their potential future. Just extremely little of that. And when I asked that question, it was always, not me. There might be some Indians in the next town over. Uh, you know, we hate those people. <laughs> um, uh, and they're real low lives. But here, no, not us. Not me and not us. Um, uh, and certainly that has changed, and I think it's true that, that there was a big increase in, 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 in self-identification, and now there seems to be a, a big drop-off in self-identification with, uh, with these various terms, because they all have very short shelf lives as euphemisms. I mean, all of these substitutes for Indio uh, uh, can't last very long before they're, you know, s uh, besmirched. Um, so, um, yeah, that's... An, and the, the other, I, I guess, uh, question that uh, is not a question really, it's just uh, I wonder uh, sort of whether Bolivia, um, now that um, oil prices, gas prices, mineral prices have, have all fallen, um, and it, it seems to me that the, all of the, the good things that the government has done, the increase in the size of, of the middle class, the kind of, I don't know, um, uh, you know, wiping out uh, um, uh, racism in the way that they have done it, which has been pretty brutal in some cases, I have to say, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, but effective, um, uh, run a risk of, of, um, of running out, really, and of losing uh, popular support when, uh, when, uh, when there's not, you know, sufficient money to to reinvest in communities, to uh, pay the Juancito, Pinto, and or any of these other sorts of subsidies that are uh, that are, are paid out and that have reduced poverty, and it, it strikes me that the Plan 2025 is it that calls for these major new forms of of, uh, of development that are about uh, plowing land and growing um, uh, soybeans, I, I imagine, and uh, things that can be sold on the international market at, at, at a profit uh, are one way of helping to, um, uh, to overcome the deficit that they're going to be running because all of those other prices have, have fallen. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, when, I, when I ask myself what else could they do, uh, I, I don't have an, an answer. One, one final thing I'll just say is that I've been really impressed by the Guarani people that I've been uh, observing over the last five years in Charagua in terms of their ability to organize across political party at multiple scales. So this is a group of indigenous people who uh, are formed as the APG, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Asamblea de Pueblos uh, Guaranis, and it's a, a, a regional group of Guarani indigenous people. And they have been, they've been mass allies at certain points. They've allied with the right-wing opposition at other points. They've, even in the same city, sometimes they, they wear the blue t-shirts and sometimes they wear the green t-shirts. and. It, it strikes it strikes me that organizing is not going to be so simple as it was. You know, when it's when it was identity politics. You know, we're indigenous. We're going to organize around. You know, with the mosque, people are going to be. It's going to be much more. 
of issue oriented. The Guaranis that I've been working with in Santa Cruz for 20 years, they're in those communities, suddenly they're where they were just super strongly just going to be indigenous capitanias and use the law of popular participation and the usos y costumbres and we're going to be the, the junta vecinal in this community. Now they're, they have no choice. The city has grown up around them. They're middle class. They've got houses. They work in the city. Now they're, now they're working together on fighting a landfill and it's working with the Coya uh, colonos that, came, that moved into their communities. So I don't know, I just think organizing is going to be different. It's going to be organized around questions. You know, I thought the question of citizenship was over when I wrote my last book, but I think now we're actually going to start seeing people struggle over what's, what being a citizen means and not necessarily what, mean, what an, being an indigenous citizen means. I think if they're going to struggle over money, funding, you know, um, schooling, housing, and, and territory. Boundaries, yeah, well, control, autonomy, decision making, politics. It's going to be local politics. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.